Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Gillette Esquera and I will be your host for today. So I'm glad a lot of you are here. Um, on behalf of the team, I would like to welcome you to the author's spotlight on Paula McLean in National Bookstore and Raffles Makati's Philippine Readers and Writers Festival here at the Ballroom 2. So I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Now our special guest for today is the author of the novels The Paris Wife, Circling the Sun, and The Ticket to Ride. She has books on poetry and a memoir entitled Like Family. So she has received fellowships from Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and the National Endowment for the Arts. So her phenomenally best-selling novel, The Paris Wife, was named one of the best books of the year of, the sever of several publications, including People Magazine, Chicago Tribune, and the Kirkus Reviews, among others. While Circling the Sun also got a lot of fantastic reviews. So friends, please join me in welcoming the one and only Paula McLean. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So we're, we're going to test the sound. It might be a little wonky. Yeah, so Paula, maybe you would like to greet the audience. They're so excited. Um, they've been here since like 12 I'm excited like too. I'm just delighted to be in the Philippines, my first visit to Manila, and decided, you know, completely delighted to meet my Philippine fans for the first time. So, yeah, welcome wonderful. to the Philippines. Thank you. <laughs> Well, how has the trip been so far? Amazing. I was just saying in a TV interview, I wish this was my real life. So maybe if you guys can do something about that, make this my real life, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> what have you seen so far? Um, besides the fantastic hotel, I went to the SM Mall, <laughs> and I was told that I needed to try Jollibee, so I did that. <laughs> I'm sort of obsessed with the um, rice in the actual paper patty. I think my children would love that with the gravy. And then today we went to an art fair, the um, Ma Arte, which I thought was incredible. And I wanted everything. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful handicrafts, jewelry, fabric, beautiful. Yeah. Wow. All right. So maybe we'll talk more about your writing process first. Um, could you tell me more about your writing day? Like um, yesterday you were telling me about your 1,000 words. Maybe you'd like to share that as well. Absolutely. So I think there's a perception among people who wish they were writers. Although I do have a secret theory that it, maybe everyone in the Philippines is a writer, right? Um, yes. <laughs> maybe, yes? Yes. Yes. I think that's true. Certainly, it's completely extraordinary the way um, you privilege books and authors, and um, that's not always true around the world. So if you don't know that that makes you special, I'm here to tell you it does. Um, I think the perception among people who wish they were writers is that you sort of wait for inspiration to hit like a bolt of lightning from the sky, and if it doesn't, maybe you'll just go shoe shopping or some, or to the movies. <laughs> and I think that m it would be difficult to actually get work done that way. So I try to be very blue collar about my work and lock myself in my office at nine o'clock after my children go to school and to not pick up the phone and to not um, go shopping and to not schedule lunch with my girlfriends or any of the things that I want to do until I've written a thousand words. So a thousand words a day, if you think that the average book of fiction is somewhere between 85,000 words and 110,000 words, the idea is if you sit down long enough and do that, you'll actually be able to write a book. And of course, that's just the first draft and many, many thousands of words get thrown away, but you have to start somewhere. All right, I think the process is similar to how you started um, The Paris Wife. Like you, you mentioned you were in Starbucks. So, uh, <laughs> we all have Starbucks. We all have yeah. Starbucks, definitely. So at the time that I had the idea to write The Paris Wife, I had never, it had never occurred to me that I might write a historical novel. Um, I was teaching three different jobs. I was teaching poetry. Um, and I read Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast 
And that really was like being struck by lightning, or I often say it's like being abducted by aliens. I just had this extraordinary idea as I was reading A Movable Feast. And if you don't know A Movable Feast, it's Ernest Hemingway's memoir of his early days in Paris, his literary apprenticeship in Paris. And it's about the beginning of his life as a writer. When he went to Paris as a young man, he was only 21, and he hadn't really published anything at all, and very different from the writer he later became. So I was really sort of struck by that period in Hemingway's life. But more than that, I was struck by the love story. And I'm an incredible romantic. And so it just um, became an obsession of mine to sort of get to the bottom of their story. How did they meet? How did they get to Paris? And then what happened so they, these lovers didn't get to keep each other? Yeah, um, it's actually a you know great start off point, but it's a little hard to write about Hemingway as well. I, yeah, I'm sure some might think it's actually sacrilege. Like, how can you write <laughs> about this great man? So, how did you deal with things like that? Well, I think if I realized exactly what I had taken on as a project, I would have been so terrified. I would have run screaming in the other direction. But because I was so obsessed instantly by the love story, it's almost like I couldn't help myself. Right? And I remember having the idea and then going to a library to see if I could learn about Hadley Richardson, right? because he doesn't tell us very much about her in A Movable Feast. And I found a biography in the library, and I just had almost, it was almost like a religious experience. It almost felt like the sky opened and the angels were singing, and I just thought, I, I have to write this book. It's, it's maybe my destiny to write this book. And I went home and I wrote my literary agent who had been with me for many years of struggling and not really finding it a readership. And, and I told her, you know, forget anything I've ever said about what I'm writing. I am writing about Ernest Hemingway's first marriage in Paris. And there is sex and bullfighting and absinthe and a menage a trois on the French Riviera. I said this in an email and she wrote back in like 30 seconds and said, oh, honey, you are too writing that book. Write it as fast as you can. And as I said, I was teaching three different jobs. I had three kids, you know, I had like a buck fifty in the bank, you know, and yet I quit all of my jobs to write every day in this Starbucks and just write my face off, just literally go all in and make that the priority of my life. And so Part of it wasn't, I never let myself really think about what I was taking on. Yeah, how dare I, right? Sort of go head to head with Ernest Hemingway. Am I a lunatic? <laughs> right. Yeah, but it worked really well. And you managed to bring out Hadley, who has, who has been depicted as sort of a lightweight. Um, the and forgotten the wife. Forgotten She's wife. a dingbat. She's the one who lost his manuscripts on the train. She's the first wife, she's the Paris wife. I think she's underestimated by history, right? Um, and so what could be more fun than to draw her out of the shadows and illuminate her story? She really does have one, but she also has an extraordinary point of view. If you think about Paris in the 1920s, I don't think there's a more delicious time in history. And if I would have told the story of Bohemian Paris, from Hemingway's point of view, for instance, or F. Scott Fitzgerald's point of view, it would have been a very different story, sort of more in the thick of it. I think that Hadley has an extraordinary um, opportunity as an outsider to tell us something we don't know, to number one, show us a side of Hemingway maybe we've never seen before. You know, the older Hemingway, the perception is, you know, he's what? He's sort of a gargoyle. He's a misogynist. He's, he's so macho, he must be gay, right? The big game hunting and the fishing, and he's seducing your wife and drinking two pitchers of martini before lunch and all of that. That Hemingway is so different from this very romantic, sensitive young man who goes to Paris and he has the purest ambition. He just wants to be up in his rooftop garret writing one true sentence at a time. And that, his dedication, his devotion, the, the purity of his ambition then is so startling and tragic when you think that what kind of ruined him was that he started to, I always say, he started to drink the Kool-Aid, right? He started to believe the hype about him, and people started whispering in his ear, you know, you're a genius, 
you're going to change everything. Maybe the rules don't apply to you. And that really kind of was the beginning of the end, not just of his marriage, but of that, that earlier self. So if you read A Movable Feast, part of the beauty of that book is to look at the poignancy and the regret and the, the nostalgia of him. He wrote it at the end of his life about the beginning of his literary career. And it's just devastating because he knows what he lost. At the end of A Movable Feast, he writes of Hadley, I wished I had died before I ever loved anyone but her. And of course, he marries three other times. So the man did not have a great track record when it came to love. That's right. But it's such a, it was a great story. But at the same time, it was heartbreaking mm -hmm. because um, yeah. some, some of you might, um, you know, might have read the book already, but I think some of you might have, you know, watched or read about Hemingway's life, and you know, you'd find out that he moves from, um, yeah, he, he had an affair, and that's heartbreaking for any woman. So tell me more about that, you know, putting that relationship in the book. Right. So his second wife was a woman named Pauline Pfeiffer, who enters the Hemingway's life uh, as Hadley's best friend. So that's the really tricky part. And aren't there rules, right? Aren't there rules about not stealing your best friend's fella, right? And so Hadley's story is sort of a double betrayal. She's betrayed by her best friend, and she's betrayed by her husband, who is also the most significant person in her life. And of course, that's a devastating story. But at that time in Paris, like love triangles, were not so unusual. If you think about um, bohemians, what we understand, it's a kind of sexual freedom as well as a creative freedom. There was something about the period after World War I where bourgeois values like fidelity and monogamy didn't seem to make sense to them anymore. And it also seemed to run counter to creative freedom. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm Picasso. Why would I want one wife <laughs> or one lover when I could have several? So when I think um, Ernest met Pauline, he actually thought that he could have them both. I don't think he thought he was ending his marriage when he took a lover. I think he really wanted, he wanted it all. That's right. And these are two very, very different women. Pauline was such a she was a modern woman, while she Hadley, was a report. She was a yes, journalist. Right, she right. worked for Vogue magazine, and she was she was wealthy and very sophisticated and stylish. And Hadley was um, not a modern woman. She was this Victorian holdout. She grew up in St. Louis in a middle class family, and so again, that's part of her outsider perspective. It's that girl who meets Ernest Hemingway at a party in Chicago in 1920, before he's invented himself as a writer. And she gets whisked away to 1920s Paris and ends up at the circle of this golden couple. Um, and in Gertrude Stein's salon and all these extraordinary, in Pamplona, right, when he's writing The Sun Also Rises. Um, so she's part of that, but she's also separate from it. So I think a lot of men and women here would be able to relate, like, you know, we can be very modern, and at the same time, um, you know, you have someone who's very simple. So these old fashioned, very old fashioned, and but there's an integrity about Hadley that really moves me, and you know, she shows her true character at the end of that relationship. And even though he broke her heart, and he, I mean, he devastated her, and it was very difficult for her to move on after the end of the marriage. At the end of Hemingway's life, and even after he had died, and his main biographer, Carlos Baker, was interviewing Hadley. So she's been remarried at this point, right, for 30 years. And when she started to tell stories about Ernest, she was so effusive. She called him a prince among men. She talked about how he gave her the keys to the world, um, that her husband got jealous and had to leave the room. Like, she still remembered him well. And so think about that. Instead of, we imagine that she would be bitter, that she would want revenge, that she, you know, that she hated him. And in fact, she still loved him after all that time. I, I'm very moved by their love story. 
such a pure love story, it like is. your your first love. Even if they don't get to keep each other. Like sometimes the great loves we don't get to keep, but they change us the most. I agree. And you know, in that in your book as well, you um, you highlighted two major scenes. Like one was um, Pauline teaching um, Hadley how to dive, and that was that went disastrously. And the other was when Hadley lost the manuscripts. Yeah. So tell me more about the, you know, your process. How did you create those tensions? So the scene, I mean, that's so what Hadley is remembered for in history, even though she's the most forgotten wife, was that she gets on a train, you know, headed for Switzerland and has a release of all of his works, his work that he's been writing for three years, everything he's written for three years, including the first draft of a novel. And she gets on the train and she steps out to get a paper and some Evian water and it disappears and his work is lost forever. And people ask me often, did that really happen? And obviously it did. And the second question is always, have the manuscripts ever turned up? You know, like we can imagine like on Craigslist, right? Or like eBay or um, <laughs> Antiques Roadshow that these manuscripts might turn up, but they never did again. And to me, that was such a painful scene to write because although the book is Hadley's book, I identify with her. I'm writing in her voice from her point of view, and she's really my vehicle. I mean, finding her was like finding a bit of magic, and really connecting with her voice allowed me to go to 1920s Paris when I had never been to Paris at all in any generation, and to, and to really you know, write with confidence and authority. But when I got to that moment, I almost couldn't write the scene. I was like beside myself crying because I am a writer too. And I, I identified with him in that moment. Um, when the book was done and it went uh, out on submission to try to find an editor, the editor that finally bought the book, I remember having a conversation with her and she's like, you know that scene? <laughs> you know that scene where Hadley loses the manuscripts? And I'm like, oh, I know, it was terrible. Like I could barely even write it. She's like, I could barely even read it. She's like, I felt so emotional. And I'm thinking that we're having this moment. She's like, okay, make it three times as long now. Make it three times as long because you want the reader to understand just what's happening in that moment. I mean, really, it's the beginning of the end of the Hemingway's marriage. If nothing else, Hemingway demanded absolute loyalty from everyone who was close to him. And the fact that she could step on a train and put his work down and leave it to get an Evian water was a sign to him that she didn't understand. That was his soul, right? That she didn't really understand what it was that he was doing with his life and who he was. Mm -hmm. It was powerful. Yeah. So after, after the book, after the success of the book, um, it went very, very well. Um, like. New York Times and everything else. Um, you started writing a book on Marie Curie. How, tell me how, how that I went. I hate to talk and about that. And to transition time towards was, your next book. <laughs> I hate to talk about that time because um, it was an utter failure, actually. And the thing about finding Hadley's voice, now I know just how extraordinary it was. But because it was my first historical novel, it was the first time that I was writing about real life historical figures. I had the perception that all I had to do was find another good idea. Well, I can just keep doing this, right? There's all these great people from history. I can just choose one and write a bestseller, and it's going to be amazing. And now I know how to do that. Um, in fact, it was terrible. <laughs> I mean, Marie Curie, first of all, like, was there maybe a, a more inspirational woman who ever lived? She's extraordinary. And I thought, I get to go back to Paris in 1894, and maybe there's no sex, but there's radium, you know, and there's a tragic love story, and, and I got very invested in the science. I got so excited about the science. I thought, I sort of thought I was a physicist in 1894, and all the instruments, like I understood all of it, but what I missed was her. There was something about her that stayed really elusive. I never found her voice. I never found the point of view. The experience that I was talking about, about being ad abducted by aliens, okay, the mothership never came. <laughs> like it never, it never came. There was never that. My favorite moment as a writer 
is just disappearing, looking up after being in a coffee shop for five hours at my computer and I don't know where I've been. And I look at the work and I know it came out of my body, but it's also not familiar. You know, that total freedom, that's also total surrender. That's the, that's the secret sauce, right? That's what we're all looking for. Instead, writing the Marie Curie book, which took me three years. I wrote The Paris Wife in seven months. I wrote A Ticket to Ride in five years, right? So there's a difference. To me now I know, too, when it's working, it goes very fast and it's not a struggle. But the Marie Curie book, it was sort of like beating my head against a brick wall every single day. And it's kind of a tragedy. I feel like I failed her in some way. But now I understand more about my process. Like, whatever it is about my subjects that speaks to me, it's quite mysterious, but also kind of unmistakable when it happens. The first time I picked up a biography of Hadley's life and opened the book and read just a little excerpt of a letter all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It was like falling in love. I thought, I, I know this woman. She was speaking right to me. And when I was in the middle of the Marie Curie book and failing and crying every day, because it was like being kicked out of heaven, I opened Beryl Markham's memoir, West with the Night, and read one paragraph from her African childhood and all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I didn't even know who she was yet, but I knew I was going to write about her. And there were all sorts of really amazing coincidences, but the number one was I, I didn't even know to turn the book over and to see that there's a blurb from Ernest Hemingway on the back of West with the Night. And if you don't know West with the Night, it's Beryl Markham's memoir for African childhood, but she was a pilot. Her historical significance is that she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic solo and nonstop east to west in 1936. So she's an aviator. Um, she's a horse trainer. She's, she's a bold, original woman. I had never heard of her. But there was something, some little piece of magic that really drew me into her world and made me, it's, it's like an obsession. It's obsession. And that led you also to explore the other characters that she didn't write about in her book. Um, if some of you might have seen um, Out of Africa, um, some of the characters there, um, like Robert Redford's, um, we call we remember him as Finch, but in the book he's Dennis. Dennis, Dennis Finch, Finch yes, yes. Yeah, Dennis Finch. Do Karen. we know the movie Out of Africa? Do you guys know? If you, come on, like, it's so romantic. <laughs> It's so romantic. If you don't cry for this movie, something in you is broken, right? And they wear great clothes. It's like being dressed in Ralph Lauren, you know, like safari clothes. And I mean, it's, it's an incredible love story. And there's Robert Redford, who plays Dennis Finch Hatton, and Meryl Streep, who plays Karen Blixen. Um, who is a great author as well, but also an extraordinary woman from history. And so these two fierce, iconoclastic women vie for the love of the same man. Yeah, so uh, somehow it's my destiny to write about love triangles. I'm not sure how that happened, but. Yeah, two friends and one, yeah. And fighting for the same guy. Fighting for yeah. the same guy. And great clothes as well, like <laughs> Paris, 1920s, and um, Africa and Kenya. So it's interesting because you kind of play detective. After reading the memoir, you, you started going around and thinking, who else wasn't written about in this book? And that's how you, know, you've, you found your other characters. Yeah, so the story, I mean, sort of my process is, is sort of um, the same in Circling the Sun as it was in The Paris Wife. There was the inspiration, so the inspiration for The Paris Wife is a movable feast, and yet I'm telling the story from her point of view. And my research is about getting to the bottom of you know, all the stuff that Hemingway doesn't tell us in A Movable Feast. Hemingway is not interested in dishing the dirt on his personal life. In fact, he went to great um, steps to avoid talking about his personal life, and the same is true in West with the Night. Beryl Markham doesn't tell us anything about her own story. She tells us about her in incredible adventures. And she really was a fearless, extremely courageous woman. 
but I'm like nosy. Like I want to know all the stuff, <laughs> you know, all the bad decisions, all the terrible love affairs, you know, the skeletons in the closet, as they say. That's the stuff that I want to know. And so Beryl, um, once I started reading biographies of her life, I understood that she was married three times and not a single husband is mentioned in West with the Night. Um, she had a child that she didn't raise that may or may not have been the product of an affair with a, a member of ro the royal family. And she never writes about that in West with the Night. She doesn't mention Karen Blixen's name, even though I know from biographies that she was embroiled in this steamy love triangle with Karen Blixen and Dennis Van Chatten for 10 years. She was so madly in love with this man that she, stalk she stalked him, essentially, without giving up for 10 years. So you have to admire the tenacity of nothing else. Yeah, it's a, you know, interesting triangle. But, like, comparing Karen and, um... Beryl. Beryl, um, you know, the, these are two very, very strong women mm -hmm. um, who had different viewpoints and finding after the same man. How was it to write about two strong women again? I feel like it, it's an extraordinary privilege to get to understand history from the inside out. And this is what it feels like. I had a reader once say to me, this genre is like a living wax museum, right? Because we like history. And we want to believe that we can, can understand it, but we also don't want to be bored. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, right? We want a little bit of history, but mostly we want to be swept away and to feel that there's an intimacy in the history and a familiarity it's sort of brought down to a human scale. And that's what it felt like to me. Um, getting to know Karen Blixen, I had read her book. In fact, I used to teach her book out of Africa but this was a much more um, tender, intimate relationship, you know, reading her letters. So Beryl Markham didn't write letters, not that are published, but Karen Blixen wrote her mother every Sunday for decades. And these were incredibly dense, textured letters that are really a, a portraiture of, of the community of 1920s Nairobi, you know. So it's another way of learning about the world. And I, I often felt that when I was, those are my favorite scenes in the book, actually, the scenes that are in dialogue between Karen and, and Beryl, because it's two of history's most unforgettable women. And I got to be sitting in a room with them, sort of like a fly on the wall, overhearing their conversations about what it means to be a woman ahead of your time. What about Dennis and Beryl? Was there something really there? Ooh. So if you read Out of Africa, it's really the story of Karen Blixen's coffee plantation outside of Nairobi and what she is sort of lost when she lost the farm. But it's also a love story. It's the chronicling of the love story between herself and this safari hunter, Dennis Finch Hatton, who died tragically in 1931. Um, Dennis and Karen had a wonderful connection. They loved art, they loved music and poetry. And it was a, a relationship of like a high-minded relationship, if that makes sense. But his relationship with Beryl was much more, they were two of a kind in terms of the, in, they had the ferocity of their independence. Beryl was such a free spirit. Um, she was untamable, you know. And that, that quality is also true of Dennis as well. Um, a lot actually said that um, Beryl is actually a lot like Hemingway. Yeah, I, I had readers say that too. She's sort of like a female version of Hemingway, and some people love that because we're looking for um, models of uh, strength and fearlessness and boldness and courage, right? She's very unlike Hadley. She's much more like Hemingway than she is like Hadley, yeah. Right. Now, in, in writing historical fiction, um, what were the devices that you used? Um, how did you get these characters? How did you get into them and try to imagine what they felt during that time? Yeah. So when I found The Paris Wife, for instance, as an idea, 
I started with biographies. There are only three biographies of Hadley's life. There's a terrific book called um, The Hemingway Women, which takes all of the women, beginning with his mother, because if you're going to understand a really complicated, messed up guy, you always have to go back to the mother, right? Absolutely. And all the wives and all the girlfriends, right? Um, so Hadley's only one of those figures. And then I had to read all the biographies of Hemingway, and then I had to reread all of Hemingway, particularly his stories that he was working on at that time, and uh, The Sun Also Rises, which he was writing during the course of their marriage, as well as Immovable Feast. And then I had to read Fitzgerald again, and I had to read Gertrude Stein, and I had to read Ezra Pound again, and I had to sort of understand, I was reading Janet Flanner to understand Paris in the 1920s, um, as a way of immersing myself absolutely in the world. I mean, I meet readers all the time who say, oh, you know Paris so well, you must have lived there. And I feel like a terrible fraud that most of the book was written when I had never visited Paris, no, nor could I. I mean, I had young children at home. I had just quit my job. I was broke. It was all I could do to sit at the Starbucks, you know, and write the book. But I think that something quite extraordinary happened, too, because I couldn't visit. I couldn't just get on a plane and go and sum submerge myself in, you know, the, 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 the scene, you know, the milieu. The, um, I had to invent it. And there was an incredible energy and synergy and magic that happened because I couldn't go there. So I just, I just went for it. Here we are. And here we are. And it worked. And it worked. So that was pretty extraordinary. I, mean, I had been working as a writer for 15 years when The Paris Wife came out and, you know, had had the experience of sort of like going to events and having there be one person there or three people there or no one there. Um, and then suddenly after The Paris Wife came out, I, I, the, the excitement for the book and the, the investment in these characters was so refreshing and um, it was pretty amazing, yeah. So what are you working on now? We're all excited to know. Well, hopefully not um, an experience like Marie Curie, um, <laughs> hopefully not. No, I'm in the middle of another historical novel about another real life historical figure, another incredible woman from history. Mm. Yeah, so stay tuned. Stay tuned. Hopefully that will go well. All right. Um, I've, I see that there are a lot of students and also a lot of writers. Um, maybe you have some advice for writers who, you know, not just necessarily want to write historical novels, but you know, just want yeah. to get a crack at it. Absolutely. So, you know, I taught for a long time. And as a teacher of literature, I taught poetry for a long time. You know, my advice to writers was always to read as much as you can, particularly in the genre that you're interested in publishing, that you're, you know, all your dreams are attached to that, and to read kind of at the highest level of the genre that you're interested in publishing in, so to find those perfect books, those books that you wish you had written, and to keep them on your desk as you write, as so to know what you're aspiring to do. And I also think that there's something um, about surrender that's pretty important for a writer. You know, the writer, I, I know this writer named Linda Barry, who's a cartoonist and a novelist and a pretty extraordinary woman, but she says, you know, when you're writing, you can never ask yourself two questions. You never ask, is it good? And you never ask, does it suck? <laughs> Those are the two questions. Is it good and does it suck? It actually doesn't matter. You have to surrender to the process, to spend, to like really to dedicate all of your time and your heart and soul and you tell your book all your secrets and you, you know, lose yourself in it. You surrender absolutely. And if you're sitting there as a critic the whole time saying that sentence, is that sentence any good? You know, that chapter that I just finished, is that chapter any good? Is it terrible? You'll be um, so constricted that you'll never be able to finish. Are there um, books or authors that you would suggest that they check out? Oh, Some that inspired you as well? Yes, I mean, just in terms of the writing life, um, 
Do you guys know the book uh, Bird by Bird by Annie Lamott? Do you know this book? I recommend it to all you know it, aspiring writers, because what it does is it gives you absolute permission to fail, you know, to not do it well, to turn off those crazy voices in your head, and everybody has those crazy voices in your head, to um, bring it down to a human scale, to battle your own demons. You know, every writer I know is sort of two people, right? We're all bipolar, all writers are bipolar. You know, one moment you're, you're sure you're a genius, and the next moment you like want to throw yourself out the window. And Annie Lamott's book, it's called Bird by Bird, is sort of very compassionate about both sides of that coin. All right, well at this point, um, I'd like to open um, for questions. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Maybe I'll start. Um, well, I've, I've been very curious, like, oh, you want to ask first? Yeah. Go, Go ahead. ahead. No? Oh, all right. Um, so maybe I'll start first um, while they um, give out the mic. Um, yeah, I was, I was wondering how much of yourself you put in your novels. Like, you're talking about other people, but is there a Paula in Oh, you story? mean like since my characters are actually historical figures, is there a place? Well, I mean, there absolutely has to be a place. So in my research, certainly what I'm trying to do is portray these historical figures as accurately as possible. But I'm also inventing an inner life for Hadley, and I'm inventing an inner life for Beryl, and there's no way that I can do that if I'm not willing to kind of give myself over and to reveal all sorts of, you know, when I'm speaking in Hadley's voice, it's my voice as well. When I'm speaking in Beryl's voice and saying all sorts of things about independence and, and love and freedom and the costs of being a woman ahead of your time, I'm also telling my own truth as well. Yeah. All right. So um, are there questions on the floor? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Hi, hi, I'm Paula. Hi. Uh, I'm Rose Am. I would like to know because you write about um, real people, and I would like to ask whether um, how is the response of maybe a family member? Has your work, be, um, um, has your fa uh, has a family member come up to you and say something about the work that you did and? Yeah. how uh, their feedback maybe yeah so when I was writing the book I actually had to kind of hide from myself that I was really writing about people who actually lived because I was kind of paranoid that I might get sued by the Hemingway family you know because they're sort of like the Kennedys in the States they're almost like American royalty they still have all this power and and it's Ernest Hemingway right it's like again like how dare I so I stopped thinking about it and then not long after the book came out, I did an event in St. Louis, which is Hadley's hometown. And um, it, was it was like, it was only like my third event when I was out on the road. And it was raining cats and dogs. And, and I had like 102 degree fever. I had a respiratory infection. I was sure I would go to this bookstore and there would be nobody there. And it was standing room only. And I decided I was going to read a section from the book that's set in St. Louis, which is Hadley's hometown. And so I read this section, and the first thing that happened when I finished and the question and answer period started, like now, is this uh, old man in the front row stood up, and he had a walker, and he stood up and he said, that was just beautiful, Aunt Hadley would have loved it. And it was her nephew, and there had been a notice in the newspaper, and they called each other on the phone and said, do you know there's a book about Aunt Hadley? And they all, the nine members of the family showed up at the bookstore, and this was her nephew, and he cried. And he said, you know, Aunt Hadley taught me how to dance, and she was the most remarkable woman, and now the whole world gets to know her. Pretty extraordinary. I mean, like, I cried, he cried, we all cried. <laughs> it was like... It was like getting this big wet kiss from the universe. So instead of like, how dare you appropriate the experience, then it started to feel like I had done something 
kind of special, which was to draw her out of the shadows, right? Out of his the enormous, like he's like as big as the moon, right? And to tell her story, which deserves to be told. Any more questions? Hello, Paula. I'm Shana. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, have there been plans to um, to make your book into to turn your book into a movie, or has anybody approached you um, to? To, to have your book turned into a movie, or if you would like that one? Well, first of all, like, totally yes, 100% <laughs> yes. I'm ready for my red carpet moments. Right. I've been ready for a while. Um, so both of my books have been options for a movie. Okay. I don't really believe in wishing for that, because it kind of feels like everything I've ever wanted as a writer has already happened, and wouldn't it be terribly greedy? And yet, I. I think they would make beautiful movies. So not long after The Paris Wife came out, just a few months after The Paris Wife came out, there was a Woody Allen movie called Midnight in Paris. Have you guys seen this? And I was still out on tour, right? And I started getting emails from readers, from fans saying, have you seen this movie? And I'm like, I live in Cleveland. I haven't seen anything. And there was this movie, in Midnight in Paris. So basically, Woody Allen and I had the same idea kind of at the same time, right? And, and there's Ernest Hemingway, and there's Crazy Zelda, and all of these people. But I still think The Paris Wife would be a great movie. I'm ready. Yeah. Any directors? <laughs> and who would you picture Any playing? Actors? <laughs> <laughs> who, would you, who could you picture playing Hadley, Hadley or Ernest Hemingway? I always think that it, uh, Hadley sort of has to be an unknown, right? It has to be someone that we don't already attach um, a story to. There was a time when I thought Leonardo DiCaprio would make a great, <laughs> mostly because I want to meet him. He's good looking as well. Ernest is so good looking when he was young. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good looking. So I mean, just, if you guys don't know, like Google, just like 1923 Ernest Hemingway passport photo. He's like, he's so handsome. He's like, like a movie star. And, and he lost his looks as he got, got older, so mostly I just like to look at the early pictures, right? <laughs> just kind of want to put up a screen and say, this is my Ernest Hemingway. That's the one I'm in love with anyway. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Would you have, uh, well, would you have found uh, Martha Gellhorn as interesting as Adley in the sense that he dumped uh, he dumped Hemingway, and yes. he was a very accomplished journalist. In Do you guys know about Martha Gellhorn? Do you guys know about Martha Gellhorn? So she is Hemingway's third wife. So he had four wives, and Hadley was just the Paris wife. And every part of his, he was very, um, it's almost like he had many lives. So there was Hadley, who was the Paris wife. There was Pauline, who was the Key West wife. Martha Gellhorn was um, a journalist, a war correspondent, and she's actually the one who found the house in Cuba, and they went to war together in the Spanish Civil War, and they went to Madrid. And she's the most interesting wife to me, and this is my secret. Um, I'm actually writing a book right now. She's, the, she's my next character. Martha Gellhorn is my next character. So I don't know, do, do you read minds? Do you, are you psychic? <laughs> And the reason she's so, I never thought that I would write another book about Hemingway, but I actually had a dream about her. And I started to rethink the idea that I wouldn't return to Hemingway. And the great thing about her is she's, she, she matches him so well. She's in ter terms of her intelligence, her, but her writing is beautiful. And she, like Beryl, is like this incredibly, courageous iconoclast, right, who like breaks the mold and the reason they can't stand each other <laughs> is je professional jealousy and they like bump heads. It's almost like an old Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn movie, right, where they have all this great tension, sexual tension and 
Yes, Pat and Mike, it's very much like that. And they're breaking crockery and screaming at each other. And they go up into the separate corners and then they write these beautiful love letters to each other. Like they can't live together and they can't live apart. It's awesome. Okay, stay tuned. All right, we have um, one last question. Hi, Paula. Hi, Jennifer. Um, first of all, um, I really love your book. And that was before I joined Penguin Random House. Um, really loved it and finished in a few days. Do you, as a writer, also feel a sense of sadness when a book finishes and you feel mm -hmm. like, oh, I have to be done with this person and this world? Because for us as readers, sometimes it's hard to let go. And this the Paris wife, that, that was the experience for me. I felt very sorry when the story ended. So yeah. as a writer, what, is, what does it feel like for you to finish a book and to, do you completely, well, you're not, you, you just mentioned. <laughs> I'm going back. I'm going, <laughs> Hemingway and I have unfinished business. But like even before then, I have to say, like I was so moved personally by the story, by their love story, and so absolutely invested in them as characters. At the end of the book, I was writing 10 hours a day. I was dreaming about them. I felt like they were real people. I felt like I was her, that I was married to him, that I was, I was so inside of it, I couldn't really imagine being outside of it. And then there's the experience of getting to go into the world and talk about the books and talk to other people. Like, writers are kind of schizophrenics. You know, we just sit at our desk all day completely alienated and shut inside the world, but then to go into the world and talk to people who have read your books, who know your characters, who love them, it's like continuing the story, right? It's like, oh, you, you, you love my people too. You're, you're as lost inside this world as I am. So then it was extended for a long time, and then when it came time to start something else, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's part of why the Marie Curie thing failed, because I was still, my head was still turned in this other direction. I was still thinking about them, and it's sort of like going through a terrible breakup, right? And your friends are telling you, I've got somebody for you to meet, and you're like, I'm not ready. <laughs> it was like that, I'm not ready. And just this idea that now I get to go back and spend more time, I really do feel like I have unfinished business with Ernest Hemingway, so the version of him that I got really close to in the Paris wife. He's a whippersnapper. He's not published anything. He has this incredible sensitivity and, and, um, and romance. And then when Martha Gellhorn meets him, he's 37 years old, and he's the most famous writer in America, right? And so who's that guy? And what's it like to be married to that guy? Yeah, and how is he different? So I'm having a lot of fun. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I've really been delighted to be here.